optimism, lost touch with science, love, and common sense. All right, 866-34-TRUTH if you want to weigh in on the Supreme Court issues we'll be talking about, 866-348-7884. Yesterday morning, I woke up and immediately just went to prayer. I don't normally do this in this way. I was going to be traveling back from Green Lake, Wisconsin, something like that, beautiful retreat center where I had been speaking at a conference and then flying through a little airport, driving about an hour to a little airport in Appleton, Wisconsin, from there to Chicago, Chicago back to Charlotte. And I, when I got up, I just immediately prayed over every aspect of the day when I'd be traveling back, who I would meet, divine appointments for witnessing, adequate time to write, to rest while flying, the rides, just every detail. I just prayed about that. I'm traveling all the time. The first thing I did when I woke up, and then the next thing I looked at my phone, and there's the announcement of flights out of Chicago canceled, severe weather, and then they were going to rebook me to fly back out today, which was not going to work for quite a number of reasons. They were going to have me on a 519 a.m. plane out of Appleton. I would have had to leave where I was at 3 something in the morning and then still get back at like 7 or 8 in the evening. So we were able to work out on an alternate route. I rented a car in the Oshkosh airport. Probably the only time in my life I'll be in the Oshkosh, Wisconsin airport. And uh, rented a car there, drove to Milwaukee, had a delightful ride talking to the Lord. And then flew home from Milwaukee. So thrilled to be here rather than still traveling today. But I mentioned that just to say it's interesting that when you consciously, actively commit every detail of your life to the Lord and things go in a different direction, you are even more conscious of the fact that everything will fall into place. There's no tragedy, no calamity. I just mean minor things. But it was just that reminder there's an interesting verse in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. In Hebrew, it says, Gol el Adonai Masecha, literally roll upon the Lord your deeds. So cast what you're doing upon the Lord, and your plans will be established. Just an, a, a beautiful concept that you take what you're doing today and roll it all on the Lord so that what you're doing today is in obedience and harmony with God and... Consequently, your plans will be established because you'll be walking in harmony with God today. Therefore, tomorrow, your plans, your thoughts will fall into place. Okay, Justice Kennedy's retirement is massively important. For example, the vote a couple days back upholding President Trump's travel ban on Muslims from certain countries this was basically on partisan lines, 5-4. And Justice Kennedy has often been the swing vote. He was appointed by President Reagan. He's been conservative in certain ways and other ways has deviated and, of course, was the deciding vote, tragically, in the vote to redefine marriage. And there's been a question about which way he would go on certain issues because, on the one hand, he is concerned about religious liberties and freedoms, and felt that you could redefine marriage without impinging on those, but that's obviously not the case. And his recent rulings have, have clearly said, listen, you cannot have an animus against religion, the ruling in the Masterpiece Cakes case with Jack Phillips. So he is retiring. And thus far, one of the things that Donald Trump has done very, very well is appoint strong conservative justices. You say, well, there's just Neil Gorsuch. Well, that's to the Supreme Court. But he has been nominating fine appointees to other federal courts. And again, these are lifetime appointments. So that over the course of his presidency, if, if he lives on and, and fulfills four years or even succeeds in fulfilling eight years, it would have a massive effect on the judiciary for decades to come. A massive effect. And you're even looking at a situation where if you get the right justice, you have the real potential of overturning Roe v. Wade. Look, the, the pro-abortion advocates, the Planned Parenthood types and their allies have been fearing this for a long time. And that's been one of the major issues with Hillary Clinton. If she had been elected, who would she have appointed? So it certainly not, would not have been Neil Gorsuch. 
And there's no question there'd be direct attack on our civil and religious liberties. There's no question there'd be the further pushing of the abortion agenda. And who knows what else? So again, you want to have on a certain level a parity so you're not just nine ultra conservatives or nine ultra liberals or things like that. And yet, if we do believe that the Supreme Court has gone way beyond its intended constitutional powers, if we believe it's taken on a role, as Justice Scalia would talk about, nine unelected officials basically having this massive power over the whole nation, the power to redefine marriage? Come on, whoever ever dreamt of that among the founding fathers, that such an issue could ever come to the Supreme Court, let alone that they would decide that two men or two women could constitute what would be called a marriage arrangement. That being said, when there is injustice, when there are things that are blatantly right and wrong, you want to have the justices ruling in the right way and in a way that honors the Constitution. Again, that is what we are basing things on. So during the days of slavery, did you just want justices that would be kind of equally balanced and maybe you go 5-4? for slavery, maybe go five, four against slavery? Or would you want every justice to rule righteously against slavery and against whatever foundational legal understandings allowed for slavery and the same in the days of segregation? Would you want justices that may go five, four in favor of segregation, may go five, four against, or would you want justices that nine to zero said this is wrong? So yes, we need diversity. And as one of my friends said, he believed the Lord spoke to him one day that that in in order for a plane to fly or a bird to fly, it needs a a left wing and a right wing. So America needs a left wing and a right wing. And I understand that. And I respect that. He also recognizes that many of the positions on the left are dead wrong, are demonically wrong. And yes, there are positions on the right that are dead wrong, demonically wrong. When it comes to life, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to family, these are things where the Supreme Court must do the right thing because of the great power that it has. So we should really be praying, not just for President Trump to appoint the right person, okay? That's big, but that's only part of the story. Not only praying for him to appoint the right person, and Heritage Foundation has been been guiding him in this process, and people he's put forth one after another after another have been excellent. I'm sure there's some exceptions along the way that would not be ideal in every respect, but from what I've followed so far, key ones have been excellent. So not only that he appoints the right person, but that this person is approved. Because you know there's going to be a hellish battle over this. You know, because the the radical left knows what's at stake here. Just as strong conservatives would know what is at stake if Hillary Clinton was in and was trying to appoint a justice that would potentially put things 5-4 or 6-3 in certain directions, you better believe conservatives would fight it. So Pray that he'll appoint the right person and pray that God will move, that the right person is brought in, nominated and appointed. All right, let's let's look at the travel ban decision. CNN has a report, five takeaways from the Supreme Court's monumental ruling in support of Trump's travel ban. This is not ban all Muslims from coming into America, but there were certain countries where he said, until we sort this out, there's going to be a ban, all right? It's a tiny minority of Muslims worldwide affected, but people took it as discriminatory, et cetera. So let's let's take a look. The five takeaways, and I cite this article because it's CNN, because it's liberal perspective. So I think it's interesting to look at this. Number one, and this is underscoring what I've been saying, elections matter a lot. Elections matter a lot. The vote to uphold the travel travel ban ban was 5-4 along along party party lines. lines. If Hillary Hillary Clinton Clinton beats Donald Donald Trump Trump on November 8, 2016, there is no No way way that the vacancy vacancy caused caused by the death death of Anthony Scalia Scalia is filled by by Neil Gorsuch. Gorsuch. So it must so certainly, certainly filled instead, instead by, by someone more likely to decide with Peter Ginsburg, Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor, Sotomayor, Sotomayor rather than, than Samuel Alito and, and Clarence Thomas. Thomas et cetera, et cetera. So, so first, first point, point is, is looking at how, how this unfolds. Unfold. Regardless, regardless of whether you like, you like the decision, decision or, not, or not, and I'll come back to that. Look at how it unfolded. Number two, this is as much Mitch McConnell's victory as it is Donald Trump's. Remember, with the passing of Justice Scalia, that President Obama wanted to appoint a justice. And Mitch McConnell was able to fight against it, say, no, no, the people have voted in a new president. Let the new president make that nomination. So interesting point there. Number three, the president has loads of power. This ruling was 
the, the five that voted for it, the five that voted for it said this is about the presidency. This is the way some analysts have summed it up. This is about the presidency, the presidency that, the, that president the president does, does have, have massive, massive powers. powers. And that and if he gives, gives an executive, executive order, order on something, something you just, you just can't, can't have some, some judge, judge down, down the line, line somewhere overturning it. Those that voted against it, especially were voting against the president. In other words, you can't give this guy this kind of power. You, you, what, what he's doing is wrong. So one seems to be more philosophical about the power of the presidency. The other side seems to be more concerned about potential abuses from this president. And then number four, the court didn't take Trump literally. So during the campaign, when President Trump famously said, no Muslims coming into this country until we can sort what in the world is going on, paraphrase of what he said, that the court didn't take him literally. Now, re remember the adage during the campaign, and, and since Trump's supporters take him seriously, but not literally, his detractors take him literally, literally, but not seriously. And then number five, the court wanted to make clear it wasn't endorsing past statements past Trump statements on Muslims. That's important because past statements he made have been inflammatory or have, or gone, have gone too far, far or, or certainly, certainly are, are not, not proper, proper for the president, president speaking, speaking, speaking for the good of the, the whole nation. nation. That being that said, said, the court, the court was court. not endorsing those past statements, but rather saying, let's look at this executive order. And it is within the purview of the president's powers. We'll be right back. What if I? I've heard it over and over and over again. Today's Jews are not really Jews. Today's Jews are just Ashkenazi. They're converts of the Khazar kingdom. They're European. They're not really Jews. And the real Jews are either Africans or the real Jews are Christians because God's done with natural Israel. Well, well, what is this based on? Some of it's based on just the latest misinformation and internet myths and things like that. Some of it's based on the good research that traces back Jewish origins and recognizes that there's been Jewish intermarriage over the centuries. That's why we come in so many different colors and shapes and forms. But, but this idea that today's Jews are not really Jews or that even if Ashkenazi Jews or other Jews are ethnically Jewish, that they're not Jews in God's sight. It's based on a misreading of Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Paul is writing in Romans, and look at what he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who are of Israel are Israel. What was the point that Paul was making? He spoke from Romans 9, 1 to 5 of the anguish that he carried in his heart, the constant pain and anguish that he carried in his heart for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to whom the promises of God remain. He says, theirs are, not were, but theirs are the promises, all right? But he says, well, it's not as though the word of God failed because the Messiah came and the promised nation didn't follow. Does that mean the word of God failed because God made these promises to Israel? And his first response is, no, not everyone descended from Israel is Israel. He's not talking about the church as a whole. He's not talking about the Gentile world. He's not talking about everyone else. He's saying that there is a remnant within the nation, just as he says in first uh, in Romans 11, 1. Uh, the, the, he responds to that again, points out, hey, I'm, I'm an Israelite. I'm part of the remnant. So he's saying within the nation, there is Again, is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at the two important decisions in the last few days issued by the Supreme Court. One is an actual ruling. The other was an order. So let's, let's take a look at the Baronel Stutzman case. I have an, an article up on the stream and elsewhere. Did the Supreme Court grant a religious rights victory to florist Baronel Stutzman? So if you remember, she is a grandmother. She is a committed Christian. She owns Arlene's Flowers and has been in business many years in her state of Washington. And there was a gay couple, gay couple regular, regular customers, customers of, her, of, her, that, of, hers, of hers that she, she served uh, at least nine, nine years, years on a regular, on a regular basis. basis. So she had so no she had problem, problem serving, serving everyone or even hiring a gay or lesbian employee. That was not an issue. 
Her issue was when one of the men came and said that after nine years together, my partner and I are going to be getting married. We're going to have 100 plus people there. And, and, and of course, you're the one. You're our favorite florist. You're the one to, to do the floral arrangement for us. And she took him by the hand. She said the hardest thing she ever did and said, I, I can't do that. You know, as a Christian, her convictions that she cannot provide a floral arrangement for something she believes is wrong and sinful in God's sight. And on top of that, for her, this is an artistic creation. In other words, buy any flowers you want, use them however you want, but don't ask me to create something that is contrary to my religious convictions. She continued to talk to the man according to the report she issued. They hugged when they were done. Well, he felt hurt. His partner felt hurt, posted on social media. The thing ends up exploding, ends up the attorney general gets in. Uh, ACLU gets in. Supreme Court of Washington rules 9 nothing against her. Yeah. So uh, to add insult to injury, the attorney general and the ACLU basically trying to bankrupt her, take everything she has, not just shut the business down, but take everything she has. And she's just firmly said she's got to do the loving thing and obey the Lord, and, and that's that. Little did she know what would happen and the national attention that would be on us, just like Jack Phillips with Masterpiece Cakes or the others, florists, bakers, photographers, and others who have simply done what was right and honest in the sight of the Lord and have lost a whole lot because of it. I mean, things are so bad that, that when funds are being raised for legal fees and things like that and personal loss to Brownell Stutzman, they got a great response on GoFundMe. Then GoFundMe shut the page down. Shut her page down. No, we're not going to allow you to do that. I mean, think, think of the level of bigotry. It's, it's not on the Christian side. It's on those hostile to biblical faith. And again, if, if you were a gay baker and I came in there and I said, listen, we, we've got this, this uh, conference we're, we're holding about people coming out of homosexuality and change is possible and that marriage is union of a man and woman. So we want these cakes baked and, and just on them, we just want you just to kind of design it, two men holding hands and like an X sign over it. Well, of course they should be able to say, sorry, that's an insult to us. We can't design that for you. Feel free and buy whatever you want here, but we can't design that for you. That'd be perfectly right and appropriate, obviously. And we give a list of many, many other things that fall in these exact same lines. So what happened was the Supreme Court did not agree to hear the case. They sent it back to the Washington Supreme Court. They sent it back to the Washington Supreme Court saying, look at our decision with Jack Phillips and Masterpiece Cakes. That was a 7-2 to two decision last month. And the court did not officially say that First Amendment rights, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, that these trump uh, so-called anti-gay discrimination laws. And I say so-called because it often goes beyond that, as in cases like this. And what is it, 22 states across the country have laws in place, anti-LGBT discrimination laws, which would then overturn First Amendment rights. They did not make a categorical statement about this. Rather, what they did was said that the, the Colorado Commission that ruled against Jack Phillips uh, exercised extreme animus against religion in their ruling. And it was Justice Kennedy who wrote the majority opinion. And it was seven to two, meaning two of the liberal justices joined in on the vote. So now the court told the Washington Supreme Court, reconsider your verdict based on our ruling here. Now, that's highly significant. Let me tell you how this is playing out. Uh, USA Today has an article and the article says this. This is a headline. Um, and so there are mixed opinions about this. First cake, now flowers. Supreme Court gives florists who refuse to serve gay wedding a new hearing. And the article begins with this. When it comes to creating products for same-sex weddings, the Supreme Court reasoned Monday that what's good for the baker is good for the florist. This is USA Today reporting on it. That's the beginning of the article. The Advocate, flagship LGBT publication, doesn't think it's significant. They said the U.S. Supreme Court has sent the case of a florist who refused to serve a same-sex couple's wedding back to the state court for review, but did not say the state ruled wrongly in finding the florist committed unlawful discrimination, leading LGBT advocates to say it's likely the state will again rule that the florist committed unlawful discrimination. And James Essex, 
director of ACLU's LGBT and HIV project. And of course, they've got a vested interest in this. ACLU is coming against Baron L. Stutzman. He said, we're confident that the Washington State Supreme Court will rule once again in favor of the same-sex couple and reaffirm its decision that no business has a right to discriminate. Our work to ensure LGBT equality is the law and the norm in all 50 states will continue. So how do we sort this out? I got an email from the Alliance Defending Freedom announcing this, and the ADF is representing Baron L. Stutzman as it represented Jack Phillips in Mass Priest Cakes as well. And they said, this is big news. This is big news. And, and they said, here's, here's what it does. It, the court did three things. It granted her petition, that is to appeal the verdict. It wiped out Washington Supreme Court judgments, the Washington Supreme Court's judgment against her. It said, okay, you got to reconsider. So it's a fresh start. And it sent her back to the Washington courts, her case back, and told them to reconsider in light of the Supreme Court's decision in Jack Phillips' Masterpiece Cake Shop. So What's the, What's point? the point? The point, the point is, is that, that if, if the Supreme Court didn't think there was something to this, they wouldn't have sent it back. Now, I was looking at, at some of the pages, of 60-something like pages of the decision against Baron L. Stutzman and, and trying to see what degree you could say there was animus against religion, hostility against religion, and, and that's debatable. And again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer or a judge to analyze it in sufficient depth. But the, the court did say this explicitly. They said it is uncontested that her sincerely held religious beliefs include a belief that marriage can exist only between one man and one woman. So the question is, how can you force her to violate those beliefs without violating her First Amendment rights in order to create something that they didn't think it was creative, etc. It's just serving, just the service she provides. But how, how can you do that without violating your First Amendment rights and showing some level of hostility to religion? So bottom line, the big news is that the court could have refused to hear it. That would have been a terrible defeat. They agreed that they, they agreed with the appeal. They sent the case back. If they didn't think there was anything to it, they wouldn't have sent it back. Now, will it switch 9-0 ruling against her to 5-4 in her favor or 6-3 in her favor? Will it even affect anyone? We'll see but it's positive. What if they rule against her again? I think the Supreme Court might be willing at that point to hear the case in terms of a violation of her First Amendment rights. Okay, last thing. So Supreme Court also ruled five to four. So it was a one vote victory again, not to make pro-lifers abortion salesmen, as my colleague John Zmirak put it on the stream. In other words, Pro-life centers in California were required by law. This was, the, this was the verdict. This was overturned by the Supreme Court. Required by law to advertise abortion services. Uh-huh. So here's a woman, and, and she's struggling. She's pregnant. She doesn't know what to do. She goes to a pregnancy crisis center, and the women sit her down and say, okay, let's talk about the baby, that you're actually carrying a baby. Let's talk about that. And let's talk about possibilities. Look, are you able to, to keep the baby? Here are ways where we could provide help and support or support and help within the city here. If, if that's completely impossible, there's no way whatsoever. Maybe you're, you're 16 years old, got pregnant out of wedlock, and you, you just, there's no way I'm still in high school. And Okay, let's look at adoption. Let's discuss that. According to this law, they'd also have to say, now, of course, you can kill the baby and terminate the pregnancy. Right down the block, there's a Planned Parenthood center. Or even if there was signage, right? If there was signage, you're advertising your pregnancy crisis center, but also, you know, do you have to advertise a Planned Parenthood or something like that? So the argument in favor of the ridiculous ruling in California was, look, many women go to these pregnancy crisis centers thinking they're going to a place where they can have abortions. So you need to give them that option. Well, obviously, when you go to Planned Parenthood, is someone requiring Planned Parenthood by law to sit down and say, no, let's look at all your options. Let's, let's look at the fact that that's actually a baby in your room. We call it a fetus, but that's a baby. Now, let's talk about the possibility of having the child. Let's connect you with support groups in the city. Okay, what about adoption? Let's, no, they're, the law is not going to require them to sit down and give equal time and count you know, back and forth and all this. So in any case... This was a ridiculous ruling. The good news is 
The good news is it was overturned 5-4. to four. The bad news is it was only overturned 5-4. to four. This is one of those things that should be 9-0, or if not 9-0, 8-1-7-2. So again, you see how important this next Supreme Court appointment could be. Let's really pray as Justice Kennedy is retiring first that God would pour out his grace in his life, and if he doesn't know the Lord, he would really come to know the Lord and enjoy his goodness the rest of his life and perhaps undo speeches and books and other things, some of the damage he did. May he live to regret the decision he made in redefining marriage. We'll be right back with my guest, Mona Charon. Hey friends, I want to take a moment to thank you for standing with us and, and show you firsthand where your funds have gone, the renovations, the upgrades to our studio, and what we've been able to accomplish with your help. Hey, come around here. I want you to see something. I don't think we've ever shown this before. So this is how things operate. All this brand new, just in recent months, recent weeks, right there, big screen as I can see what's happening that we need to be seeing. Over here are different clocks for radio for different segments in time. Over here, this is, if we're putting things on live stream, you're gonna see what I'm seeing right here. Over here, this is where I'm in contact with the rest of the radio studios. Calls come in, I interact over there. And right over there, you can see where there's a second camera. That will be used when we have guests in studio so that we can get everyone on camera. Right now, we haven't been able to do that, but we're gonna be able to do that. This is also going to enable us to have different angles as we do Skype videos and Skype debates. But, but let me show you some of the most exciting stuff. Hey, come this way. All right, I want you to meet Caleb. Caleb is our video, audio, computer tech expert. He's new here. He's only part-time. We need him here full-time. We are now able to do our daily live stream of our radio show, so you're watching it on video. You're hearing an audio clip on the radio. You're watching a video on YouTube. Something happens in the news, boom, they're on. We've got high-tech equipment. Pull it up, put it on the screen. I can talk about it, read it to you as you're watching at home. It, it's, it's amazing. And we now have new equipment that's going to enable me on the road to do high quality live stream of my radio show in America, even in other countries. And, and oh, we've got a big gap here. We need a major new computer. Not only will it enable us to get things out even more quickly, so something happens in the news, you're frustrated out. What does Dr. Brown have to say? No problem. We got it covered within minutes. It's up, it's out. But we need this for post production as well. We need one more person sitting here. If you can believe it, the thousand plus videos that we have out, plus we record in there from the Ask Me Anything broadcast for God TV and the NRB TV Line of Fire broadcast, recorded right in there in our studio. We do all of that with me and one and a half employees. We need to add Caleb full time. We need one more person in here. We need that computer. With that, friends, the sky is the limit for what we can put out. We are your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Help us amplify your voice. Together we're making a difference. A generation is being impacted. So your one-time gift goes a long way, really, in helping us advance this Jesus revolutionary cause. And we'll be back with more updates as they happen. Cultural and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us today on Lot of Fire. I have a very important subject to cover with an important guest with an important new book. I'm talking about New York Times bestselling author Mona Charon. She is a political commentator. You've probably seen her on TV in the past or read some of her columns. She has a new book out, Sex Matters. Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense. Uh, Mona is also married mother of three. And when she speaks on these topics, uh, obviously she has a good listening audience already built in. So 
we want to explore this topic today, how modern feminism lost touch with science, love, and common sense. Mona, welcome to The Line of Fire. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Great to be here. All right. Uh, first, you start off your book talking about feminism has triumph. You're not just talking about some movement or some fringe radical idea. In what way has feminism triumphed and at what cost has feminism triumphed? I, I give feminism credit for some advances in our society. Um, I, I could list them if you like, but equal pay for equal work and uh, treating women as full legal and moral and political equals of men, all of that is pretty uncontroversial. Where I think feminism made some disastrous wrong turns was in attacking family life and diminishing the importance of marriage and endorsing the sexual revolution and also wedding themselves to certain ideas that have proved to be just flat wrong, such as the idea that all the differences that we see between men and women are entirely socially constructed and are not arising from natural differences between men and women. All right. So even in the very title, Sex Matters, you're saying that there are differences between the sexes, which bizarrely enough is something highly controversial today. So, <laughs> so let, let's start there with the idea that biology is not bigotry. Let's start with the idea that there are differences. Now, you look at things not just in one culture, but in many cultures to say there are distinct differences. So what does science say about differences between the sexes? So um, since the early 1970s, when these ideas came into uh, general acceptance, there's been decades of scientific research showing, for example, the influence of hormones on developing fetuses, looking at differences in brain organization between men and women, looking at differences in the way infants, few days old, react to stimuli, and there are notice, noticeable differences. Um, a baby girl just a few days old will respond differently to the sound of a human in distress than a baby boy. And a baby boy is more likely to look at a flashing lights or, or moving objects than a baby girl. These things happen and show up so soon they can't possibly be socially constructed. They seem to be hardwired. Similarly, if you look across cultures and across times and places, um, men, when they look for a mate, <clears throat> Men tend to be interested in women who are young and beautiful, and women tend to be interested in men who have resources. Now, you would think if that was socially constructed, there would be some societies where it was the other way around, mm -hmm. where women would look for young and attractive boys to marry, and men would look for women who are older and wealthier. But it doesn't happen that way in any society, and so you have to begin to think, maybe there's something innate here. Yeah, and, and something innate, whether it speaks of a creator uh, which is, is a no-brainer for me in this, or whether it just speaks about this is the way we evolved. If someone else is looking at you, you can't, you can't deny these aspects. So to say these things, though, is to characterize you now as a bigot or a homophobe or a transphobe, whatever the latest phobe is, and we're told, <laughs> oh, no, no, there's a lot of science that supports the idea that your men are trapped in women's bodies and things like that. But you're looking at a much broader way and saying it just doesn't work itself out like that. And I think it was Ben Shapiro pointed out during recent floods that you had women protecting children and men protecting women. It just, things kind of unfold a certain way. They certainly do. And um, one of the things that I try to say in Sex Matters is that we will all be happier if we accept that nature is a certain way and not try to push too hard against uh, things that are uh, beneficial. So, for example, um, men are naturally protective toward women. Um, this is a beautiful thing about male nature. It's not something we should attempt to, to, to push out of their psyche, right? We, we like that aspect of masculinity, although feminists have this tendency to label everything as toxic masculinity. I mm. think that men need to be appreciated for their, for their good traits as well. And um, obviously, any civilized a society is going to trend, try to push back on some of the less desirable aspects of masculinity, like a tendency toward aggression, mm -hmm. a tendency toward sexual predation. Those are all things that we should be attempting through socialization to limit. Similarly, women are drawn to children and drawn to caring for children. Should we be pushing back against that? Should we be saying we want to, we want to remove that aspect of femininity from our society? No. That's a nice aspect of, of feminine nature. 
we should be doing everything possible to encourage it rather than say that this, because it's different from men, that it's somehow lesser. Friends, I'm speaking with Mona Charon, New York Times bestselling author. Her newest book, Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense. In the home, are there differences between mothers and fathers? Yes, there are. And it turns out that men bring a special elixir to the uh, process of parenting. There are many studies that show that fathers, and I've seen it in my own life with my own kids and my own husband, where fathers tend to be more playful with kids, more challenging. Um, My husband used to throw these babies into the air and catch them again, and they would squeal, and my heart would be in my throat. But they loved it, and it taught them something about risk and about, you know, stress and about stress relief. And it turns out that when fathers roughhouse with their boys especially, but girls too, but more boys, it teaches boys important traits that they will need later in life about how to handle conflict with other men. And um, all of these things are, again, you know, they, they are cross-cultural. You will always find wherever you look that women are the more nurturing sex. I know the feminists are going to go crazy when they hear me say that, but it's true. Women are more, nur- mothers are more nurturing. Fathers are more challenging. When, they, when a father and mother are at a playground and they see their daughter on the jungle gym, The mother will say, be careful, and the father will say, see if you can get to the top. That's the way we are, and it's complimentary, and it's wonderful. Yeah, it it is. It really is beautiful, you know, when when you look at breaking this down and everything is equal. So obviously, equal work deserves equal recognition, equal pay. There have been positive contributions of feminism, as you mentioned. But as you have a chapter, Viva la Difference, the, there are beautiful, wonderful things in diversity and difference and what a mother brings to the equation and a father brings to the equation in, in so many different ways. So let, let's just back this up a little bit because this flows out of the sexual revolution of the counterculture movement of the, of the 60s and everything is liberation, etc. So women were now going to be liberated from their roles as childbearers and liberated from domestication. And as a result, uh, women have become more sexually active outside of marriage. Overall, hasn't this hurt women more than helped women? It has, and it's hurt men, too. That's what's really interesting. Of course, the image we all know about of women who are struggling, single mothers, attempting to do everything and, and exhausted and sort of one uh, job loss or, or accident away from disaster all the time, we're familiar with that, and that's one of the ugly consequences of family breakdown. But what's becoming clearer in the last few years in particular is what a high price men are paying. Men who are disconnected from their own children, are disconnected from society, from their communities, and very often are not in the workforce because they don't have that grounding of being connected to a woman, the mother of their children. Um, that marriage is the bond, the first building block of healthy society and it has been um, extremely damaging for everyone and especially for children and does that also tie in with lower birth rates today that family children are just not esteemed the way they used to be so that is a more complicated thing and i don't i'm not going to hazard a guess about that because i have not studied that question and um I, I would hesitate to offer an opinion when I haven't, when I don't have the backing of the of the data to support a, a, a supposition. So I would say only that birth rates are falling all over the developed world, and um, it's something that's a little bit worrisome when you look at a country like Japan, where they don't even have a replacement population, and who's going to be paying taxes to support the elderly? So that is a huge problem. But I don't want to. Uh, extend beyond my area of expertise and, and speculate as to why it's happening. Got it. That's wise. Yeah, in Japan, you're talking about having you know robots take care of the elderly. It, it is it is a real crisis. <laughs> I don't. I only brought yeah. it down just because of larger issues with breakdown of nuclear family or lack of esteem for for babies and children. So wh- when you were growing up, uh, I, I was born in '55. So you know, we're growing up and you know within decades of each other and things like that. There was a certain view of parenting of the home, of, of women, of what was proper and improper. So now this whole, this whole movement to liberate women, th- does that lead to a, a place now where 
because women are viewed differently. It opens the door to a rape culture. I'm, I'm certainly not saying feminism causes a rape culture, but but you're you're you got a whole chapter dealing with that. What's happening on campuses? Before this break, let's just draw some lines here. How does all this connect? The way it connects is that when you um, when you say that sex is unimportant or that it's just a just fun or just a roll in the hay and uh, and you you um, remove the barriers to easy sexuality, I think it can open a door to the worst men and tell them that, well, you know, since it's no big deal, it's just like a handshake, why shouldn't you, you know, make, try to get away with whatever you can with, with any woman who comes within your orbit? Um, because you, you've removed the idea that this is something semi-sacred that ought to be part of a marriage and only there. And so I do think it opens the door to some extent to bad behavior by the worst men. Yeah, friends, I'm speaking with Mona Charon, her new book, Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense. Hey, I've got a, a bunch more questions for you, but 30 seconds. Who'd you write this book for? I wrote it for everyone, but I really hope that I can persuade people who might not have thought of these issues in this way. I'm not trying to preach to the converted. I would love for younger people to get this book in their Christmas stockings or wherever and say, you know what? I never thought of it that way, but I can sense that something isn't right in relations between men and women. And this gives me a template for understanding how to make things better. My friends, we will be right back. You've got a young person in your home or friend that would say, nah, nah, this is crazy, it's bigotry, it's bias, old-fashioned. Get him the book, Sex Matters by Mona Charon. We'll be right back. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit, he said he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to askdrbrown.org. AskDrBrown.org, and when you go there, we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel and the Jewish people. Together, we're making a great difference. Now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the House of Israel, to share in this end-time harvest of Jewish souls, and to find out how to receive this two-DVD set, Predestination, Election, and the Will of God Debate. Go to AskDrBrown.org and click the TV banner. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I'm speaking today with Mona Charon, her brand new book, Sex Matters. And you've seen her on TV. She's a political commentator, journalist, also a wife and mother. And, and we'll get to that right at the end, Mona, about you can you can have it all. But but let's talk about campus rape culture. You've got a whole chapter on this. What's going on? Why is it so important that we address this? Um, so first of all, let me say I'm awfully sorry, but I really only have two more minutes. I have another. Go ahead. Go. You go. I know you're busy. Do and, it. Just, and I'm so sorry. that uh, That's all right. Uh, it's okay. live radio. We're really? used to change. We're good. Okay. Um, just really quickly. Um, 
uh, I, I talked to many students in the course of writing this book, um, and um, and I will tell you that they know that this is not the ideal, this is not the kind of social life they want, and um, that one of the things that I call for in this book, which uh, has been done at Boston College and a few other places, is a return to the ethic of dating. And you'd be amazed. There are so many students who've never been out on a date. When you tell them what all about it, they're excited. The idea of the ask, the idea that they would go out with someone that they have a crush on, but there would be no alcohol consumed, and uh, and uh, it would be over by 10 p.m. And uh, you know, it's it's exciting for the kids because they would they would really have to interact as a human being, one human being to another. Interesting. Um, and uh, not not treating. Uh, a, a, another human being is simply a uh, a masturbatory aid, if you'll forgive my language. Got it. Hey, Mona, I know you got to run to another interview. Thanks for staying through the break just to be courteous. I appreciate that, and all the best to you on the book. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. I- so, speaking with Mona Charon, again, the book, Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense. Hang on, let me get that in the picture. How do I get that in the picture there there we go there we go all right yeah it is fascinating when you realize how things have broken down how people are just so quickly hooking up so quickly having sex and you know it it cheapens things in fact i'll tell you a funny story uh they're friends of ours godly couple and a little bit older than 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 me i think uh godly couple a great family and when they were they were engaged and again they were godly back then they were raised in good home environments there was no possibility of, of sexual relations before marriage and <laughs> to give you an idea of how pure of heart the woman was they were with some friends at a campus apartment i forget something like that talking whatever it was and the uh, the guy she's going to be marrying, and they've been married, I don't know, 40 plus years, whatever, uh, he realizes that his fly is down and he stands up and zips his zipper up. And she says, there's nothing left for marriage. <laughs> Seeing a fiance zip his fly up, that was, that was too, too much. I mean, it, wasn't, it was an unconscious thing on his end. But that's quite a far cry from kids, you know, hooking up and having sex and, you know, when, when they're 15 years old. And, and listen, the shift, the radical shift, friends, took place in the 60s. And by the way, because we just bought seven, eight, nine minutes, I didn't know we had seven minutes maybe. If you're watching on YouTube and you have a question you want to ask me, if you post it in the next few seconds, I'm going to see if I can get to it. So I'm looking at my YouTube screen over to my right. If you have a question on any subject under the sun, you want to ask me. If you post it quickly, I'll see if I can answer it. And if there's one posted earlier, our team will will grab it. Okay, so the shift took place dramatically in the 60s. And it took place in front of my eyes. And I was caught up in that whole scene. So again, Beatles come to America in 1964. That's the year after the assassination of JFK, the year after Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. It's a time of great upheaval in America. That's, that's two years after the Supreme Court removed organized public prayer from schools. So again, Vietnam War protests, a time of great upheaval in America, great change. And 68, a pivotal year of tremendous change, the assassination of Martin Luther King, riots in cities across America, assassination of, of uh, RFK, Robert Kennedy, and, and then protests in the Olympics and just it, it, and revolutionary turmoil across the world, the May Revolution in France, uh, Russia rolling into Czechoslovakia, uh, protests in, in Mexico and among the populace there, one thing after another after another. So uh, a a time of massive upheaval, massive upheaval. And during this time, sex, drugs, rock and roll, Easter religion just swept in in a rebellious young generation, but a young generation that was also searching and looking for something. So 
the change came dramatically where just the way the girls dressed in school and girls being sexually active and drug use and guys being more active it just happened in front of our eyes. And that radical shift has come at what cost, at what price. That's why purity is beautiful and important. All right, some questions. First, this is now a random shift. I'm answering some YouTube questions. So, and if you've never watched on YouTube, if you don't listen on radio, that's awesome. We're thrilled to have you as a radio listener on podcast. But you can watch on YouTube or Facebook. Ask Dr. Brown, ASKDR Brown on Facebook or YouTube. Okay, Isaiah 9, the prophecies there. Are they in the past tense? Ki yelled you lad lanu ben ni tan lanu. Yes, for a child is given to us, a son is born to us. These are past tense. You say, well, how can that be if it's predicting the Messiah? Well, two possibilities. One, it could well be speaking of the birth of Hezekiah and prophecies spoken of his birth because he was the representative king in the Davidic line, but they're not fulfilled in him. They're fulfilled in the Messiah, Jesus. Or it's what's called the prophetic perfect that you speak of something as if it's already happened, even though it's future. Uh, A question was asked, how do I deal with believers who are closer to Catholics like James Robison? First, James is one of the finest men I know on the planet, absolutely devoted to Jesus, an evangelist to to the bone, uh, a lover of people, a lover of the Lord, and uh, believes that he should work with believing Catholics. And I work with believing Catholics on the stream. And that's a vision he's had to bring those voices together and, and uh, yet not to compromise any evangelical principles. Do I believe Catholics are saved because they're Catholic? No, my own understanding, and I know this will offend some Catholics viewing and listening, is that Catholics are saved despite some of the core teachings of Catholicism. But the emphasis on Jesus and the cross, if rightly understood, will lead to salvation. If we're only understood, will lead to a dead works theology. And, of course, that's where I differ with Catholicism. What would I say to a child who's struggling with same-sex attraction? First thing, I'd love on that kid and be more involved in that kid's life than I've ever been. And I'd make that child understand these attractions are not who you are. They don't define you. They're just attractions. And these attractions can change. Listen to yesterday's broadcast, my interview with Philip Lee. Get a book by Tom Gilson, G-I-L-S-O-N. I forget the exact name of the book. I did write an endorsement for it. I really appreciated it. But it's having conversations about homosexuality with your children. All right. So Tom Gilson, G-I-L-S-O-N. If you search online, you'll find it pretty quickly. All right. Um, since Marilyn Murray O'Hare got prayer taken out of schools in the 60s, the moral decline started. Yeah, that's really very true. David Barton's analyzed that, put, put out charts, 62 organized public prayer removed from the schools, 63 organized Bible reading removed from schools. And where I grew up, the schools in New York didn't have it before, but plenty of other schools around America did. And when it got removed, even if it was just symbolic, even if it was there in a symbolic way, it was just a generic prayer to God, a 22-word prayer to God. To me, the symbolism is of removing God and the word from schools. So yes, I, I do believe that that has been demonstrated. My friend Lou Engel got really burdened to, to pray along these lines and for, for the restoration of some of these things, at least uh, an appreciation of the hearts of believers, looking at those charts from David Barton. In light of Matthew 12, 42, what did Jews think was necessary for salvation in the Old Testament? So Matthew 12, 42, I, I know the section, but just having to look at the specific verse, so I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, could I comment on the Ben Shapiro new video talking about why he doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah? Yeah, these would be fairly standard uh, reasons that Jewish people don't believe in Jesus, the things that I've heard for, for many, many decades now. Ben, of course, is going to be gracious in raising them, but but standard stuff, I would say for sure. Um Matthew 12, 42 says, uh, okay, the Queen of the South will rise up. All right, that's, I knew the section, didn't quite see how the title with the question. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and look something greater than Solomon is here. So I'm not entirely sure how that ties in with the question of Jewish expectation of, quote, salvation in the Old Testament. The emphasis in the Old Testament for a Jew was more corporate than individual. 
more corporate of God's blessing on Israel as opposed to individual salvation. That being said, it was believed that one had to obey the law of Moses, believe in the God of Moses and obey the law of Moses in order to be in right relationship with God. And where one fell short, there was repentance and atonement that was given uh, to be made right with God, but again, looked at more on a corporate level than an individual level. And we take those truths and now we bring them into the New Testament to show why salvation can only come through Jesus. All right, that was a fun few minutes, bonus questions there. Back with you tomorrow. It's Thoroughly Jewish Thursday already. Can you believe it? God bless.